She was a stunning blonde that no man could resist. You either wanted to have sex with her or take care of her, or both. He was a grifter who managed to con his way into her heart. He's basically just a small time hustler. Stardom finds a small town girl, thanks to Hugh Hefner and Playboy magazine. This wasn't just a Playboy model. She was comfortable in films and television. But her rising fame is complicated by a shocking love triangle involving Stratton, her husband, and an A-list Hollywood director. She had started dating Peter, and I knew that she was still married to Paul. All leading to two bodies found under suspicious circumstances. Uh, the crime scene was bloody. The 12-gauge um, shotgun at close range does create a lot of uh, carnage. And it's up to a determined detective to separate the truth from the drama. There was just no physical evidence there to collect as far as fingerprints. Who killed Playboy centerfold? Dorothy Stratton. On a beautiful summer afternoon, Patty Lerman is roller skating on California's Venice Beach. She's trying to reach her friend and housemate, Paul Snyder. Paul told me that he was going to meet me later to call and make sure because he wanted to go roller skating. But nobody answered the phone. Patty tries for hours. She talks to a friend who's also trying to reach Paul. He's worried and tells Patty to go home right away. Something's not right. You need to go in there. I've been trying to call. Paul is not answering his phone. You need to go in there and find out what's going on. I went in the house and went down the hallway and knocked on the door, and nobody answered. And knocked again and opened the door. saw Paul's body laying on the floor. And then you saw Dorothy's body laying on the bed. I, I was in shock. Yeah, it was horrible. Homicide detective Richard DeAnda, a 12-year veteran of the LAPD, is one of the first investigators to arrive at the home Patty and Paul share, 10881 Clarkson Road in West Los Angeles. When I pulled up to the scene, it was secure. There were uh, black and white and uniformed officers. They had cordoned off with tape uh, the entrance to the house. Off of the living area towards the rear of the house, that's where the victims were. There was uh, a male and a female. They're both nude and obviously deceased. No wallet, no nothing. We haven't found anything yet. Captain Glenn Ackerman has been assigned the case with Richard DeAnda. Ackerman has worked homicide with the LAPD for seven years. We don't know who this guy is. Detectives start by examining the victims. His condition was obviously deceased. He had a massive uh, head wound. In fact, the whole top of his head was gone. Dorothy was laying off the side of the bed, and she had seen the shot coming, so her fingers had been blown off on the other side of the rim. As if she was raising her hand to say, don't. Next, the detectives notice an unusual padded bench. It's designed for sex. Specifically designed to permit the restraint of someone for their course. <laughs> and something on it catches Detective DeAnda's eye. On the apparatus, there is medical tape. Obviously, somebody was strapped to it. And in closer examination, I can see that there's blonde hairs on the tapes. 
the detectives learn from uniform officers at the scene that the victims are a high-profile couple. I was told who they were, that it was Dorothy Stratton, that she was the uh, Playmate of the Year. She's there with her husband by the name of Paul Snyder. Somebody call Hugh Hefner. Somebody murdered his Playmate of the Year. Even by Hollywood standards, Dorothy Stratton's rise to fame is swift. The male victim, Paul Snyder, made Dorothy Stratton a household name. Paul Snyder discovered Dorothy when she was working in a Dairy Queen in Vancouver. In 1977, 17-year-old Dorothy Stratton goes by the name Dorothy Hoog Stratton. When Paul Snyder meets Dorothy, he knows she's his ticket to the big time. He was charming her, he was wooing her. And he said, I have aspirations for you. I think you could be rich and famous. I think we should take some pictures of you. And sent them to Playboy, and, and Playboy got them. And Hugh Hefner flew Dorothy and Paul in from Vancouver. Former playmate Roseanne Catton Walden meets the pretty teenager the day she arrives in the United States. She seemed very, very young, very um, scared. She was in Los Angeles, and she was in the office of Playboy. Playboy founder Hugh Hefner sees talent in the fresh-faced blonde, and Dorothy Hoogstratton is reborn as Dorothy Stratton. Dorothy was the whole package. She was a knockout, she was beautiful. And she was really good for Hugh Hefner and the Playboy company because it, it put a friendly face on the models. You're looking at a still image and however you feel about that sort of thing, it has no personality behind it. You're looking at a beautiful woman with no clothes on. Well, Dorothy could take it off the page. He did make her Playmate of the Month in April of 1979 and she was chosen for Playmate of the Year in 1980. Hefner always wanted a Playmate that could cross over into the film industry. This wasn't just a Playboy model. She was comfortable in films, in television. They could go places with her. Dorothy is on her way to becoming a Hollywood star. Dorothy's lover, Paul, appoints himself as her manager. He has ambitions of his own. He's going to uh, create this, this Dorothy Stratton creature that's going to be so famous, and he's going to be you know, on top of the world with her. He wanted to be a big guy. He was an alpha male. But being Dorothy's boyfriend and manager is not enough. Paul proposes, and he and Dorothy elope in Las Vegas. She said, oh, I just married Paul. And I was like, what? <laughs> she said, well, he's done so much for me. Now, 20-year-old Dorothy Stratton and 29-year-old Paul Snyder are dead. With no witnesses to the crime, Detective DeAnda tries to understand what happened. You kind of take a stand back and you look at it and try to determine, OK, where's evidence, what is evidence, and what actually happened here. You have two dead bodies there, and it appeared that it, they were both shot. The detectives wonder, if a thief shot this young married couple, was this a robbery gone horribly wrong? There was some jewelry. I don't recall how much. She had $1,000 in her purse in cash. And there were just items that would have obviously been taken had the motive been to rob them. So that pretty much eliminated robbery as a motive. So Detective DeAnda looks to the victims for clues. Uh, both bodies had head wounds. It is apparent that it's a shotgun, a 12-gauge shotgun. That's consistent with the shells that are on the floor. Initially, at first glance, we could not see the weapon, which was concerning. Detective DeAnda knows from experience 
that finding the murder weapon is key to finding the killer. You guys haven't found anything? Not yet. The male is face down on the carpet. As I move closer to the male, lo and behold, there's the gun. He was laying on top of the shotgun. Now Ackerman wonders if Paul shot Dorothy, then turned the gun on himself. It had all the earmarks of murder-suicide. We, we didn't jump to a conclusion, but that was our, our first impression. Ackerman looks for more evidence of murder-suicide, but something seems strange. If Paul shot himself, how did he land on the gun? I mean, naturally, when you think about someone taking a shotgun to themselves, if they were to shoot themselves, they would, they would be propelled in the opposite direction. And that's why this was so unusual, because he landed on the gun. Detective DeAnda looks for fingerprints to confirm Paul Snyder fired the weapon. There was blood all over the floor and all over his hands. And there was just no physical evidence there to collect as far as fingerprints because they were obliterated with the blood. And for a suicide, there's another vital piece of evidence missing. It looks like it might be a murder suicide. We always look for a suicide note. We couldn't find one anywhere. Detectives Ackerman and DeAnda can't prove Paul Snyder pulled the trigger. Have you talked to the lady downstairs yet, Patty? Patty Lerman tells DeAnda that Paul is not capable of murder. I just know Paul would not kill someone. He loved Dorothy. Earlier that day, before I left to go roller skating, Paul was in a really good mood. I don't think Paul killed Dorothy. He really loved her. I, I think there was a third person. It seemed like somebody else may have had something to do with this. Patty Lerman also gives Detective DeAnda his first clue. She tells him Dorothy has been having an affair with a Hollywood heavyweight. She was sleeping with Peter Bogdanovich. In 1980, Peter Bogdanovich is one of the most celebrated film directors in Hollywood. She had started dating Peter, and I knew that she was still married to Paul. I mean, something bad was going to happen. With two bodies and a crime scene that offers up little evidence, detectives Ackerman and DeAnda follow up on Patty Lerman's lead. They're about to uncover one of the most tragic love triangles in Hollywood history. <laughs> LAPD investigators Richard DeAnda and Glenn Ackerman are on the hunt for a killer in a brutal double homicide. 20-year-old Playboy centerfold Dorothy Stratton has been found dead in a home in West Los Angeles, alongside her husband, Paul Snyder. It's a grisly crime scene. Both have been shot in the head. Uh, the crime scene was bloody. The instrument used was a 12-gauge shotgun, and that usually does quite a bit of damage. The detectives first think this is a murder-suicide, but Paul left no suicide note or fingerprints on the murder weapon. The couple's housemate, Patty Lerman, tells the detectives, Paul is no killer. I can't even imagine Paul shooting Dorothy, you know, and then shooting himself. I, I just felt like possibly there could have been somebody else that, that came in and did that. Patty Lerman also reveals that Dorothy is having an affair with a Hollywood icon. She was sleeping with Peter Bogdanovich. I found that there was a, another person by the name of Peter Bogdanovich romantically involved, and so it was basically a love triangle. A love triangle is always significant in a murder investigation because one of the participants may be jealous, envious, and these emotions can lead to murder. The detectives wonder if Peter Bogdanovich killed Dorothy and Paul. They set out to learn more about the adulterous affair. Playmate Roseanne Catton Walden is at the Playboy Mansion 
when Bogdanovich and Stratton first meet. Dorothy and I were standing next to each other and talking, and he was on the other side of Dorothy, and I saw he was like looking at her, looking at her. Well, most people who met Dorothy Stratton were smitten with her. Uh, it was one of those sort of Marilyn Monroe things. You either wanted to have sex with her or take care of her, or both. Bogdanovich spent a lot of time at the Playboy Mansion, so he knew his way around women. And Dorothy didn't respond to him like a lot of women would. So Bogdanovich at the Playboy Mansion sees Dorothy and does a, hey, I could put you in one of my movies. Here's my number, call me. <laughs> She's like, yeah, sure, I'll call you, and doesn't. But I think that surprised him about her. Dorothy has unknowingly caught the eye of one of the most famous film directors of our time. Like playmate Dorothy Stratton, Peter Bogdanovich's rise is meteoric. Within four years of moving to Hollywood, he goes from mild-mannered movie historian to celebrity film director. Peter Bogdanovich had several hit movies under his belt with The Last Picture Show and with Paper Moon. The Last Picture Show, starring Sybil Shepherd, garners eight Academy Award nominations and catapults Bogdanovich to stardom. But Bogdanovich is more than just a star director. He's a hopeless romantic who falls for his starlets, including 21-year-old Sybil Shepherd. And he left his wife for her. He, he divorced his wife to be with Sybil Shepherd. When Sybil Shepherd leaves him, 40-year-old Bogdanovich finds a new muse. Peter Bogdanovich's persistence eventually uh, got Dorothy to the point where she was going to work with him. He cast 20-year-old playmate Dorothy Stratton in his new film, They All Laughed, and whisks Dorothy off for five weeks of filming in New York. But the set is closed to Dorothy's husband, Paul. He's forced to stay behind in Los Angeles. When you're in a film set or when you're in a film crew, you sort of develop an intimacy while you're together. The detectives learn it's not long before Dorothy moves into Bogdanovich's hotel suite. <laughs> I was on set when Dorothy was filming with Peter in New York, and that was when I found out that she had started dating Peter. But for Peter Bogdanovich, the relationship is more than a set romance. He's fallen hard for the gorgeous blonde. I think he was kind of stunned by how quickly he became really attached to her. With Dorothy so far away, Paul tries to stay connected by phone, but she can't be reached. Hi, uh, yes. Yes, it's Paul Snyder calling. He would try to call, and he could not get through. They would say, I'm sorry, you know, she's not taking any calls, or that line's, you know, do not disturb on there. I mean, Peter Bogdanovich had sort of a, I don't know, control issue? I don't know if that's quite the term to use, but if anyone wanted to get through Dorothy, they had to go through him. He's the one, I think, that put the block on the phone and no information on where she was or what was going on with her. I think that Bogdanovich became obsessed with Dorothy. When filming ends, Bogdanovich makes it clear he wants Dorothy for himself. Peter told Dorothy if they are going to pursue a relationship together, she has to leave Paul. But the love triangle continues. Detectives Deanda and Ackerman wonder if Bogdanovich found Dorothy and Paul together, killing them in a jealous rage. When the detectives were investigating the murders, they had to go to Peter Bogdanovich and find out where he was. It's just the way things are. An individual who's involved in a love triangle and, and one of the individuals in that triangle ends up deceased, 
you have to look at them as a potential suspect. They're definitely a person of interest. Yes, sir. When I uh, spoke with uh, Peter Bogdanovich at his home, he was uh, distraught with the, the death of uh, Dorothy. Um, where were you on the night of Miss Stratton's murder? Peter Bogdanovich was at home that day and, and spent the day in his house in uh, Bel Air. I was here at his home. And there were other people there uh, at his home who managed the, uh, the, the estate. Peter had an airtight alibi. There was no questioning the fact that he could not have been there. With their best suspect eliminated, the detectives feel the heat from the media as reporters demand answers about the death of the beautiful blonde. I had people from the London Times, even from far away as Moscow, show up to interview me about this particular crime. You have media attention, which be really becomes a, a major issue in a, any type of high-profile case. They're constantly wanting updated information. They're constantly wanting to insert their own ideas and their own information. So it takes you away from the investigation. Deanda stays focused on the case and wonders, if Peter didn't kill Paul and Dorothy, who did? He looks closer at Dorothy's husband, Paul Snyder, and what he discovers is shocking. I obviously you know, did a deep dive into his background. He was dealing with people that were involved in drugs and prostitution. He was in business with dangerous people. He dealt with danger. Deanda now wonders if a shady deal gone wrong ended in murder as detectives take their investigation into LA's criminal underworld. All eyes are on LAPD homicide investigators Richard DeAnda and Glenn Ackerman as they work a high profile case. Playmate of the year Dorothy Stratton has been found dead in a West LA home. Lying nude next to her husband, Paul Snyder. Both have been shot. Stratton's murder hits her fellow playmates hard. Everyone was just devastated. She was just really lovely, had a very gentle quality about her. Deanda and Ackerman have ruled out Dorothy's lover, Hollywood director Peter Bogdanovich, as a suspect. Peter Bogdanovich was at home that day and, and spent the day in his house in uh, Bel Air. Deanda wonders if one of Paul Snyder's shady business associates had a motive for murder. Paul Snyder is from Vancouver, so Deanda gets in touch with Canadian police. Schneider did not have a formal criminal record, but I talked to people that knew what he was doing, and he was, he was committing crimes. He was a, just a, a local a Canadian low-life punk that um, he was just uh, into everything he could to make a dollar. And for a man who doesn't have much money, Paul Snyder sees himself as a high roller. Snyder was a flashy guy with tight jeans and fur collars and gold rings and gold necklaces. But Paul is running out of money. He didn't even have a green card. He couldn't work legally in the United States. Dorothy's modest playboy income helps to support Paul in the US. But to make ends meet, he does business with dangerous people in the L.A. underworld. Snyder, almost by definition, was a dodgy individual, and thus people that did business with him were equally as questionable. Paul goes into business with Soman Steve Banerjee, a nightclub owner who's a criminal and known to be ruthless. Steve Banerjee was well known to be a very brutal boss. Banerjee did have a record. He hung around with a real tough crowd. And he was just a, a really tough individual. If you were competing with his club, he would try to burn down your club. If you were competing with 
him as a businessman or were a partner in taking his money, he would have you murdered. Detective DeAnda wonders if a bad business deal drove Steve Banerjee to kill Snyder and Dorothy. Steve Banerjee is dangerous, but he also owns a wildly popular nightclub. It features male strippers who take it all off for women. The club is Chippendales. Banerjee claimed he saw a male strip show, and that gave him the idea that he would make it higher class. But Paul claims Chippendales was his idea. The Chippendales dancers wore white cuffs and bow ties. The idea probably came in one of the brainstorming sessions that Steve Banerjee held with Paul Snyder. Paul told me that he, um, he came up with the idea of the male exotic dancers. But then in the long run, he got screwed out of the whole deal. And I did Chippendales without him. Paul has no stake in the business, but he acts like he owns it. So Paul spent a lot of time at Chippendales and sort of like the uh, the king of the roost there and strutting around like this was this was his thing. You're too shady for my club, man. Really? Yeah. You understand that? Paul's cocky attitude yeah. makes Steve Banerjee angry. Steve Banerjee never wanted to share the limelight or the credit for his creation with anyone. To make good with Banerjee, Paul Snyder pitches him a new idea. Snyder always had a new idea, you know, be it a wet t-shirt contest or, or a wet jockey shorts contest. So let me hear you. Paul sells Steve Banerjee on a female mud wrestling act for Chippendales to attract male clients to the club in the yeah. afternoon. Monday, Monday uh, mud wrestling Mondays. He tells Banerjee it's a sure winner. Let's give it a shot. Just like that? Just like that. Oh, I'm not going to let you down. No, it's going to be good. The detectives learn Paul's show is not the big moneymaker he promised Banerjee. I told you I'll give you we one try. try. One try. It's not working out. Steve. Paul Snyder's female mud wrestling show did very poorly. It just didn't fit with the Chippendales image, which was very high class and Steve Banerjee terminated the contract with Paul Snyder. That's it, yeah, that's it. Please, Steve. We're done, but just that's We're it. We're done. Why don't you let me that's speak? It. It's unclear why Steve Banerjee would want Paul Snyder dead. But DeAnda learns that when Banerjee fights with business associates, they're sometimes found murdered. There was a doctor who invested with Steve Banerjee to do a adult Disneyland style amusement park in downtown Los Angeles. And that doctor, years later, uh, was murdered in his home. Detective DeAnda wonders if a business dispute somehow led Steve Banerjee to kill Paul Snyder. I want you out of here. Get out. Yeah, drive away. There was speculation that Banerjee could have been involved in this murder case. Uh, I went over to interview Steve Banerjee at the actual Chippendales location. Banerjee has an alibi. He was seen at his club at the time of the Stratton murder. But Banerjee is a rich man who wouldn't get his hands dirty. DeAnda wonders if he hired hitmen to murder Paul, <laughs> catching Dorothy in the crossfire. OK, just, just calm down. Calm down, everyone. Just, 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 The detectives look closer for evidence Banerjee sent hitmen to the crime scene. Well, we always dust for prints, every crime scene. And uh, we always look for trace evidence, that sort of thing. We couldn't find anything that would implicate a third party, nothing. There is not one shred of evidence that Banerjee is behind the killings. With all other viable suspects ruled out, Ackerman and DeAnda turn their attention back to Paul Snyder. Playmate of the year Dorothy Stratton is found dead in her West L.A. home. And LAPD detectives Richard DeAnda and Glenn Ackerman are on the case. Stratton's corpse is found naked next to her estranged husband, Paul Snyder. Both have been shot. And there is nothing at the crime scene 
to clearly identify the killer. There was just no physical evidence there to collect as far as fingerprints because they were obliterated with the uh, blood. Detectives DeAnda and Ackerman have already ruled out two suspects. Dorothy's jealous lover, director Peter Bogdanovich, had a rock-solid alibi. There was no concern at all about him being involved as being a suspect in this whatsoever. Paul's ruthless business partner, Chippendale's founder Steve Banerjee, had no clear motive to kill Paul Snyder. And neither Banerjee nor his henchmen can be placed at the crime scene. Now, there was no physical evidence that showed that Banerjee was involved in this killing. Now detectives DeAnda and Ackerman wonder once again if Paul Snyder killed Dorothy, then shot himself. He pops her, he takes himself. The media speculate that Snyder couldn't have shot himself since he fell forward on the gun. But DeAnda knows better. There's a lot more to it than just assuming that because you put a gun to your face and you shoot it, you're going to go backwards. You may go si sideways, you may go forward. Uh, you know, it's, that's not absolute. And while Paul left no suicide note, perhaps the murder and suicide weren't planned, but happened in the heat of the moment. Suicide victims often leave a suicide note, and uh, in this case, uh, there wasn't one. It's an assumption made on our part uh, that he intended to do this initially. DeAnda wonders if something happened that suddenly pushed Snyder over the edge. You have to consider all the possibilities, and there's a lot of jealousy involved in a love triangle. When DeAnda talks to Paul's friend, Patty Lerman, she says that after filming in New York, Dorothy started staying overnight at Bogdanovich's Bel Air mansion. So Paul made a desperate effort to save his marriage. She went and talked to him, and at this point, he was trying to just at least have a conversation with her to see what she was doing, you know, what she would just avoid it. Yeah, I'll hold. Lerman tells DeAnda Paul was frantic and decided to confront Dorothy at Bogdanovich's home. And so he waited in the bushes for Bogdanovich and Dorothy to come back that evening. But Dorothy and Bogdanovich don't show up. The couple has jetted off to Europe on vacation behind Paul Snyder's back. I found out that Snyder had found out that Peter Bogdanovich had taken Dorothy to Europe and that Dorothy lied to him about that trip. So when they went to Europe together, Paul knew that it was not just a passing fling, that this was getting serious. He felt Dorothy slipping away from him. He was losing his grip on his star. With Dorothy gone, Paul has no money. Like his ingenue, Paul is Canadian but only Stratton is allowed to work in the United States. He couldn't have a green card. He didn't have a way to work here legally. So he was spending Dorothy's money quite freely, like he would be doing his own. And therefore, she had to finally put a stop to it because they were running out of money. Broke and unable to reach Dorothy, Paul resorts to crime. And it was so pathetic that he, he actually went to a bank with a blonde and saying, this is my wife, Dorothy. We want to take some money out. I mean, that's how bad it got. So uh, Snyder was getting desperate. And I think he already took Dorothy as a, as a loss. And he saw Patty Larman as, as an opportunity. Well, Dorothy's gone. We'll use her. And he started grooming her to become the new Playboy model. Lerman tells detectives that Paul was out of options. So he did the one thing he could to save himself. He tried to create a new Dorothy, and he set his sights on 17-year-old Patty Lerman. He sent me to modeling auditions, and he managed my career. Paul wanted me to get into Playboy and also get into acting. He was going to take her to Hefner and parade her around, and you know they're going to say, well, he did it once. He could do it again. And uh, it didn't quite work out that way. Hey, hey Mr. Snyder. Yeah. Hi there. Paul drives to the Playboy Mansion near Beverly Hills and demands to see Hugh Hefner. Mr. Snyder, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to let you in. 
During the course of dealing with the security at the Playboy Mansion, I had learned from them that uh, Snyder was not allowed on the Playboy premises at all. And that was like the kick in the teeth for Snyder. That was it for him. And he was getting really paranoid and really angry. We're going to give you three seconds, Mr. Snyder, all right? Three seconds. One, two. All right, all right. He felt that um, he was being shunned from the Playboy Mansion, which he was. Uh, they did not want his type there. He realized that he had nothing at all. That was it for him. He was, he was gone, extricated. And I think that that's when he just flipped. Hello? With nothing to lose, Paul begs Dorothy to meet him one last time and bring him cash. Yes, hello, hi. To his relief, she agrees. That'd be great. Paul doesn't know Dorothy has a plan of her own. What I believe happened was that Dorothy went there for all intents to leave. This is it. I'm, I'm leaving you for sure. This is what's going on. Here's a little parting gift for you, but I'm going to begin divorce proceedings. Paul needed money, and she felt bad for him, so she was going to meet him someplace and give him some money. She brought $1,000 to pay him some money. And uh, that probably triggered the event, realizing that Schneider, at this point in time, was going to be cut off, and he was not going to receive the monies that he thought he was going to receive. You hear? Detectives DeAnda and Ackerman will soon find out what happened in Paul's bedroom and the tragic final trigger that took the life of Dorothy Stratton. LAPD homicide detectives Richard DeAnda and Glenn Ackerman are on the verge of solving a brutal double murder. Playboy Playmate of the Year, Dorothy Stratton, is found dead in West LA, lying next to her estranged husband, Paul Snyder. It's a cruel end to the 20-year-old starlet's dreams. You know, living in Vancouver like she was, and didn't really imagine a life any bigger or more fascinating than that. This beautiful girl plucked from obscurity, coming to Hollywood and becoming rich and famous. LAPD detectives DeAnda and Ackerman believe this was a murder-suicide. And it's up to them to finally piece together what happened. Through the course of the investigation, we ruled out every suspect. And it became self-evident that Schneider had shot Dorothy. But to seal the case against Paul, they need hard evidence. The gun at the crime scene is coated with blood. There are no fingerprints to link Paul Snyder to the murder weapon. But when the detectives interview housemate Patty Lerman, she confirms it was Paul Snyder's gun. One time we had a barbecue party at our house, and one of his friends was there that had a, a pistol. And Paul was saying that he wanted to get one because he wanted to have one in the house for safety. Detective DeAnda chases down Patty's lead and gets his first piece of solid evidence against Paul Snyder. Snyder found a shotgun uh, being advertised in one of these throwaway papers and purchased the uh, shotgun just a day or two before the murders. Now DeAnda knows Paul bought the murder weapon and what triggered him to use it. We finally were able to put all the uh, pieces of the puzzle together and figure out exactly what happened the day of the uh, murder-suicide of, of Schneider and Dorothy Stratton. Paul! You here? The events of that terrible day begin with Dorothy arriving at the house to meet with Paul, as he had requested. She came over sometime around noon or just before noon. The only person in the house was Schneider. Hey. Um, 
I have your money, it's in my purse. She brought $1,000 to pay him some money, and uh, that probably triggered the event. I mean, Snyder was being slowly edged out of Dorothy's life, basically told to get lost, and, and here's some money. It's like sort of the ultimate insult. $1,000. That's what I'm right to. I want a dog. I want a dog. Detectives DeAnda and Ackerman believe Dorothy also tells Paul she and film director Peter Bogdanovich are in love and want to get married. I love Peter. And he loves me too, okay? Messiah was certain that he was going to lose his meal ticket and then that he would have nowhere else to go. So he was desperate. I think Paul is out of control at that point. He could not see a happy ending. No, I don't want that. For the final act, Paul Snyder forces himself on Dorothy. What are you doing? Paul, Paul, Paul. Get undressed. <laughs> okay. Please don't do this. Take off your clothes. Take them off. Okay, okay. <laughs> I think that Paul Snyder was exercising his last bit of control over her. Come on. Evidence at the crime scene paints a terrifying picture of the moments that led to murder. On the sex apparatus, there is medical tape. It is apparent that she was strapped to it. I can see that there's blonde hairs similar to what Dorothy's hair is, where the tape was pulled off. It was apparent that after they had sex on this apparatus, that Schneider had taken the tape off and, and she sat on the bed. No, no. Physical evidence shows that after he killed Dorothy, Paul was struck by the reality of what he had done. His handprints were on her, and blood was smeared on her with his hands. He may have been holding her in remorse of what he did, and then shot himself. I think he gave up. I think a combination of Dorothy and he wasn't going to really have a career. I was called by another playmate who told me what happened, and we both just started crying. We couldn't believe that it had happened. It, it was really sad to lose them both. You know, I was really lost after that for a while. I mean, it's sad for both of them to be gone, but Dorothy had a whole career ahead of her. Dorothy Stratton is laid to rest at West Village Memorial Park Cemetery in Los Angeles. What could have been considered a Cinderella story turned out to be a real tragedy. This beautiful girl plucked from obscurity, becoming, coming to Hollywood and becoming rich and famous. Uh, that would have been a nice ending, but uh, it didn't end that way. The death of Dorothy Stratton is a tragedy, but Deanda takes comfort in having proved beyond any doubt that Paul Snyder was the killer. Working the homicide is, um, is truly, um, because of the hours you put in and the hard work you, you put in, it, it truly is a, a passion. <laughs>